YouTubes. All right, guys, so we're going to start the review for time period four, starting with 7.1. Did anybody have 7.1 in their groups at school? Uh, we had 7.1. Um, okay, go no, ahead, Hendrick. I, I wasn't doing the first two. That was the aces. So you have the third? Yeah. Okay, I'll do the first two then. Nobody else said 7.1? Okay. So what it says is the West dominates the global order at the beginning of the 20th century. So in other words, this is continuity. When we start period four, the West is still the dominant society on the planet, the United States, Western Europe, et cetera. Okay. However, they lose their empires over the course of the 20th century, most of them. And then we have new states in places like Africa and Asia over the course of the 20th century, and they, the Western states lose some of their power. Now it says land-based, which we know you'd conquer your neighbor. And it says maritime based. Anybody know the word maritime? Anyone Water. maritime? Water. Water. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Feel free to participate. It's okay. Um, yeah, maritime means sea based. So we have to sail across a large body of water to get there. So we definitely have that. Uh, for most of the Europeans, they're not conquering their neighbors, they're conquering people far, far away. All right, good. The second one. The older land-based empires, we have three listed, the Russians, the Ottomans, and the Qing, the Qing dynasties in China. All of those empires will collapse early in time period four. Now, all three of them have a lack of industrialization. That's the thing they have in common. The Ottomans and the Qing had tried in the 19th century and then quit. They didn't finish those reforms. And the Russians have a little bit of industrialization. They built a very long railroad. Excuse me, but as you may remember, in World War I, they shoot more bullets in a day than their factories can make. So they're just not going to be able to compete. And then both the Ottomans and the Russians are destroyed as a result of World War I. The Qing don't make it that far. They collapse in 1911, three years before the war starts. So all three of them lose their empires early on because of a lack of modern technology, because of uh, two of them war pressure, and um, Russia will have a communist revolution. And we'll talk more about that later. But we know that Russia is going to be led by a guy named Vladimir Lenin, who's going to propose some radical changes, such as uh, government ownership of businesses and kicking out the czar. We've had a czar, a king in Russia for almost 900 years at this point. So it's going to be a very different system than we're used to. So that's the broad strokes of that. We'll get into more detail about the Russians, especially later. All right, Hendrick, will you do the bottom one for us, please? Yeah. Um, states around the world challenged the existing political and social order, including the Mexican Revolution that arose as a result of political crisis. Okay, just um, for, the, you don't have to read it to us. We all got it. So just go ahead and summarize it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so the Mexican Revolution is sometimes viewed as, re, viewed as regional. However, it was national and it lasted around 10 years and it broke out because of a pres presidential rivalry and it completely rebuilt the Mexican culture and government. Okay. Um, any idea why you would have a revolution in this part of the world? Um, because they want to like fix how everything is. Yeah, broadly, that's true. Uh, the Latin American states, as you may remember, become independent early in time period three. They've been independent for about a hundred years. We do not establish democracies in most of these states. We do not industrialize in most of these states. So they're still producing primarily cash crops uh, for foreigners to use. And in Mexico in 1910, their dictator has been in power for 36 years by the time we get to 1910. So there's just, it's not much better than it was under the Spanish. So we're looking for more economic opportunity. We're looking for political freedom and independence. Those are all factors that contribute to a revolution in a place like Mexico. Okay, anything else to add there? Do you have the next page too, Hendrick, or just that one? Uh, no, that was Jacob's. Okay, that's fine, no worries. He's busy in Mexico, so we understand. All right, so. 7.2, the causes of World War I. Anybody have that one? Okay. There is an acronym we used in school. Anybody? This is dangerous. Anybody remember the acronym, what it might be? MAD. Nope. No. Four letters. Militarism. Alliances. MA. MA. What? what? Maps. Nope. Imperialism, MAI, and nationalism. That spells? Maine. Maine. Again, I'm going to be more forgiving. In class, I'd give you a disappointed look. Hey, we're trying to survive a <laughs> pandemic. It's all good, kids. It's no worries. This is a kinder, gentler, smiling more than once an hour, Mr. Rich. So you're okay. I'll still judge you. 
that's one less paragraph in any of your recommendation letters two years from now, but I will still, you know, it's fine. All right, anyway, don't worry, the dad jokes are coming. You're lots of them on the way. So Maine, militarism. We have been building up arsenals of weapons for a good half century. We have not had a major war in a long time. So at some point, if we're going to justify spending this much money on weapons, we got to use them. Also, because we haven't had a major war in a long time, the logic is that we are aggressive. We want war. Heck, if we have a war, we're going to win it. So there's no doubt about that. So let's bring it on. If you know anybody that's fought in war, they tend not to have that attitude because they know how bad war can be. So we are militaristic. A, as you see there, alliances. We have set up all these people that we're going to fight with. They're secretive mostly. Our rivals don't know who our friends are necessarily, which makes it dangerous. Because if I know that if I'm going to pick a fight with Tyler and he's got four friends with him, I might be more hesitant to do so. If it's just Tyler by himself, I know I can take him because Tyler's weak. So that's not a problem. But if I'm going to fight five people, I might be like, gosh, I don't know. And like Peyton's one of them. I don't want any part of Peyton because Peyton's nasty. He'll fight hard. I know that. So any man that wears like a gamer console to a, a class review session is hardcore. So um, therefore, we know that I would be less hesitant just to fight Tyler with his friends than Tyler by himself. We don't know that in World War I. We don't know who the enemies are necessarily. So we talk big and we're like, I'm going to go in and fight. Turns out we have more enemies than we thought. Uh, imperialism, of course, having colonies, fighting over who gets what colony is going to cause conflict and tension. We're frustrated by that. And then the last cause is in nationalism, this belief that we are the best country, that we are the dominant power in the world, that if we fight a war, of course, what's going to happen? We're going to win it. So main causes, they're all broad. There's not a lot of specific detail here. They would never ask you an essay on the causes of World War I, I think, because it's just too broad to write a good essay about. All right, good. All right, 7.3, next page. Conducting World War I. Anybody have 7.3? Uh, that one. Okay, go ahead, dude. Um, so, total war is a war that like, includes all the people in a country, so like even the citizens. So like if they bomb a place, they bomb like citizens too, and not just like government officials. Um, and political propaganda is like the government stretching the truth about people to create a common enemy so that everybody like hates a specific group of people. Okay, I'm showing you from class the poster I showed you where the little girl sitting on her dad's lap and says, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? And of course, Daddy was a coward who didn't fight, so he looks like he's going to poop himself. And so that is an example of that propaganda where we're trying to basically coerce people into fighting. Go ahead. Uh, and then the next one, new military technology is like nuclear artillery and like explosives. Not in World War like One. No nuclear yet. Oh. Uh, That's World War Two. New new weapons, yes. Nuclear, not World War One. Can you think of a, a uh, new weapon in World War One? Anybody uh, want to help right them out? Not right now. No. Okay. Anybody? The machine gun. There you go, Peyton. Gamer oh. fourteen. Good job. So that is uh, the machine gun. That's good. Excellent. All right. What does it mean to mobilize a population, Hendrick? Um, to make them mobile? No. Nope. <laughs> nope. Anybody? Ideas? Thoughts? Does it mean to, like, help them, like, make their army bigger or something like that? Yeah, to get ready. So like right now we're mobilizing resources to try to provide more resources to help people who potentially could get sick from the coronavirus. So more hospital beds, more ventilators for people that need breathing help, that kind of thing. So those are all examples of potential mobilization of resources, getting more people to be prepared. So that's not just sending guys to fight. That's we got to clothe these dudes. We got to feed them. We got to get them weapons. That's all got to be done. If we're going to have millions of men fighting, we got to have those because if we just send them and say, go fight. We know what happens when the Russians do that. They get their butt kicked. So we're trying to prepare people. So that's what mobilization is. All right. And you already did the second one about technology. Uh, and because the technology uh, is better, what does that mean in terms of deaths and injuries to soldiers in the war, Hendrick? Wait, what? The second one there on page 132. Says yeah. So because we have better technology like tanks and poison gas and machine guns what does that oh, mean yeah. for the so death it'll kill a lot more people 
Yes. World War I kills 9 million soldiers, way more than any war ever before. Okay, good, Hendrick. Thank you. Anybody got 7.4? Okay. <clears throat> Wait, me. I could do it. Yeah, man, go ahead. You got it. Uh, I can I can take the first one. I don't have the second one, though. That's fine. Um, so following World War, oh wait, um, okay, so after World War I, the governments became more active with their countries, trying to recruit more soldiers and help their economy recover, and the illustrative example was the New Deal, which was where uh, Franklin Roosevelt began a program of immediate economic relief, uh, reforms in agriculture finance to create sustainable living and, like, help people, like, live normally again. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. Because the Great Depression is so bad, the only way, think of the economy like an engine. The only way you're going to run an engine is you got to have gasoline, right? If you don't have any gasoline in the engine, it's not going to run. Problem is, and so the metaphor is the economy is our engine and we need money to be spent as the gasoline. Well, when the economy's bad, what are rich people going to do? They're going to pull their shell inside the turtle and they're just going to ride it out. They got plenty. They can wait. No big deal. If you have a second freezer in your house, you can go to Kroger and buy a month's worth of food and you just sit on it for a while. Not that anyone's done that recently, but there you go. If you're a poor person, do you have the money to buy in bulk? No. You don't go to Costco because you can't afford to buy more than what you need right now because you don't have a lot of extra. So poor people can't help the economy when it's in trouble. The logic is that the only entity that can help put gasoline in the economy is going to be the government. So the government's got to spend money. And so that's what the New Deal is you were mentioning. So like they build dams, they build roads. If you go to a park sometimes, you see like if there's a pavilion to have lunch, it'll say like built by New Deal 1935. You're like, that's been there mm -hmm. for 80 years? Yeah, because it was a way to get people jobs and to do things for our country when the economy was bad and help people get jobs. So mm -hmm. that's what we're doing this week. I don't know what you've been paying attention to news-wise when the government talks about bailing out the airline industry. Who, who, who's flying right now besides Jacob Rosenthal? Almost nobody. All right? So the problem is we don't have that money, and so the airlines will collapse. Well, if the airlines collapse, that's bad for our country when we get going again here in a little bit. So we're going to probably bail them out. That's when the government talks about sending a $1,000 check to somebody so that they can help make ends meet if you're a restaurant waiter or waitress and you don't have the ability to um, – make ends meet to help your family survive. So those kind of things are, um, that's, that's what we're doing in the new deal. It's what we're doing now. All right. Very good. Now the bottom one, the Soviet union, this is communism that in communism, the government owns the means of production. The government owns most of the land. The government owns most of the businesses, if not all of them, the government is the only employer. And so we plan the economy five years at a time. We try to figure out how many supplies we need how much we want to produce, and then we just plan it out. Well, the problem is in five years, a lot can change. I mean, who would have planned for this a year ago? The answer is nobody, clearly. Um, we're trying to make plans right now to fix it. Uh, imagine we'll be better prepared for the next time if something like this were to happen again. But right now we're struggling to get tests and find if people have this illness or not. So that's something that we're trying to work on. Um, when it says repressive policies, to repress obviously is to censor or to punish. So we know that Stalin kills people if they oppose him. We know he sends them to prison camps in the middle of Siberia. Those are examples of repression. And then we see negative repercussions. A repercussion is a punishment. So this would be like people starving to death because Stalin chooses to sell food to foreign countries during the Great Depression instead of feeding his own people. So those are some pretty, I don't know, starving to death is probably a pretty negative repercussion. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, cool. Thank you, Hendrick. 7.5, anybody have 7.5? Yeah, I have that one. Okay, Evie, go ahead. Um, okay, so for the territorial gains, I did the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Okay, oh, and you're using the illustrative example. Okay, gotcha. What does that mean? Um, that was a imperialist concept that was created for the Asian country that Japan's like Japan occupied and these countries were basically like exploited and the populations and economies were manipulated into like um, helping and benefiting Japan's economy and their empire. Yes absolutely so in other words China mostly also Korea those places they conquered um, Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere sounds like a BS name for a colony. 
because yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, what's about your second one? And then I did the Indian National Congress for the resistance. And that was like the first nationalistic party made in India. And it was a political party. And it was basically just formed to try to be independent of Britain and like fight against them and have their own say in their government. Absolutely. Good. Perfect. Uh, the most famous member of the Congress party, Gandhi. So, and his nonviolent protest. All right, Abby, thank you. That was great. Moving on to 7.6, causes of World War II. Anybody have that one? Okay, so I'll take that one. World War II is a little more specific. Broadly, we know it's bad people doing bad things and nobody stopping them. It's also the Great Depression. It's also fear of another world war after we've had millions of people uh, be able to vote and acquire that ability. You have a guest star there, Evie. Um, so... <laughs> That's one of my favorite parts of this is uh, this morning somebody's cat came across uh, their screen. So it's all sorts of fun while we're doing this. Um, anyway, so you look at the specific things. The World War I peace settlement was crap. The Treaty of Versailles said Germany did the whole thing and Germany has to pay for it, which is ridiculous. The Germans are angry. They're frustrated. And it leads them to support a brutal dictator, Adolf Hitler. And Hitler's number one applause line when he's giving his speeches for many years in Germany as he's trying to get office is, I'll get revenge for the Treaty of Versailles. I'll get you guys what you deserve because we got messed over after World War I. And he has a point. And that is an argument that really rings true to a lot of German people. It also says then the Great Depression, of course, are, people are broke. If you want to look at why Hitler is successful in Germany, why people like him, even though he does terrible, terrible things, in 1933, when Hitler takes power, the unemployment rate is 30%. Almost one in three adults who can't have a, who want a job can't have one. That's really bad. In 1938, five years after he takes power, it's 2%. 2% unemployment. And so he lowers the unemployment rate by 28% in five years. So unless you're Jewish or a communist or one of the targeted groups, most people don't ask a whole lot of questions or complain because yeah, Hitler's says some things that a lot of us don't like, but man, he's got me a job and I'm happy to feed my family. So thumbs up for that guy. Now, of course there are the brutal anti-Semites who've always hated Jews and this is their chance to act on that. But many people in Germany are just happy to have a job. And when you have bad economic conditions, people will often just deal with other things normally they would not like. And I think that's definitely true. Um, and that's what it says at the bottom, the rise to power of totalitarian, aggressive, you know, all that stuff. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Next page. 7.7, .7, conducting World War II. So World War II, I think we could definitely see a comparison between World War I and World War II, the trench warfare of World War I, for example, versus World War II. Anybody have 7.7? .7? Uh, I had that one. All right, Tyler, go ahead, man. Um, so first it says that World War II was a total war. So this is like what Hendrix said, like everyone was involved. So it wasn't just the armies fighting. Um, and then it says that governments use lots of strategies. Um, so propaganda, this would be like the posters that they hung around. Um, so lots of art and media. And then nationalism we know is like hating anyone that isn't you. So it's like a way to basically have like a lot of pride for your country, but to the point where it's a hatred for anyone who isn't you. Um, and then it says they did all this to mobilize the populations. So that would be um, just to get ready for war. Um, so getting troops and supplies. Um, and then governments use ideologies. So fascism is basically like, it's a far right ideology. So you use ultra nationalism. It's very controlling. And then communism is where like all stuff is owned by the government. Um, hey Tyler, where is that uh, on the political spectrum? Uh, far left. Yeah. So far fascism. And, yeah. So fascism and communism, both extreme ideas, but on the far end, away from each far, other. Yeah. yeah. Um. And yeah, so they just did this to mobilize their people for war. And then the second one, new military technology, that would be like the atomic bomb that the United States dropped. Um. And then that just led to a lot more casualties because no one was ready for that. So they didn't have any way to um, prepare for that. What's firebombing? Uh, um, 
Is it like, I don't know. Anybody know? Any military nerds in here? Play Call of Duty, Peyton? <laughs> isn't it like, <laughs> isn't it like, like, like sending a whole bunch of like small bombs over like a city? True, but what's the purpose of it specifically? To, um, are we hitting like specific targets? No. No, we're literally a firebomb is a, it's called incendiary. Like if you say something is incendiary, it's on fire or it's, you know, like a really idea, like, like you all say things are fire. That would be that. So like Mr. Rich's mixtape lyrics are incendiary. <laughs> that would be an example. All right. Good news is of this shutdown of our lives, I've had a chance to work on some of my lyrics. I've got new music coming out in SoundCloud very soon. So be sure to follow. But anyway, um, what that means is that they weren't just trying to like attack one place. They're trying to set a whole city on fire. These are bombs. When they drop, they literally explode and spread fire. So they're not trying to just drop a bomb on my house. They're trying to drop a bomb on my house and burn down my entire neighborhood. So are innocent people going to die when you do that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the purpose. Just to give you some context, we kill over 140,000 Japanese people in World War II with the firebombing of Tokyo and other major cities. That is more than the people that die immediately from the two nuclear bombs combined. And we are doing this for three years before we get to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that's an example of total war is that civilians are also targets. Now, can you give us examples on the left-hand side, Tyler, of the, of the illustrative examples there on that page? Yeah. So the first one I did was um, Great Britain. So we know that Great Britain was basically trying to defend from the Nazis. Um, so they mobilized um, by just preparing troops to defend them. And then a lot of women were given more opportunities because of this. Um, so like to work in factories and stuff, to prepare stuff for the troops. And then um, Germany with Adolf Hitler. Um, and that, well, obviously the Nazi party was created. And then also the industry in Germany was completely reorganized. Um, so they were just a complete, like, uh, everything else was shifted to prepare for the war and to help them in the war. Okay. Good. How about the second one? Um, the new military technology? Uh, no, the totalitarian states. Oh, yeah, the Germany. Okay, yeah, we've already talked about that. Okay, good. All right, thank you, sir. 7.8. Anybody got that one? Okay, Sydney, um, can you tell us a little bit about it, please? Um, I did Cambodia during the late 1970s. Okay, go ahead and do the, do the Nazi one first, and then we'll come back to Cambodia. Is that okay? Uh, you mean? The main body there under historical developments, which they misspelled. Yeah. If you're looking, make fun of the college board. Historical developments, they left out the T. Ha, ah, college board. All right, anyway. Um, so there were extremist groups. <clears throat> um, well, what do, Sydney, what do we call, like, what is the broad term for like what happened in the Holocaust? What do we call that? Where we kill people because of who they are, or what they worship or wh what they look like? Like autocracies or like. Starts with a G. The killing of people based on. Genocide. Genocide. You got it. That's correct. So World War II is a, we see a genocide. Okay. Um, good. So we, I think we all know about that, but just want to make sure we cover it. So go ahead and do Cambodia then. Um, the leader was Pol Pot and his group was known as the Khmer Rouge. Um, and they took control of Cambodia um, and a civil war occurred um, since 1970 and he killed over 1.7 million people through torture, starvation, and work. And it lasted to 1979. Okay. And he often, he will copy, I don't know if you all watch my China lecture. I'm sure you've watched it multiple times. But he will copy what the Chinese do in what's called the cultural revolution, where we decide to blame our problems on the intelligent folks, which seems like you have no ideas left when you're like, you know what sucks about our society? Smart, highly educated people. And so we make them go, like doctors go in the countryside and pick rice and we close down schools because schools are just ways to indoctrinate kids, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so Cambodia does the same thing the Chinese had done about a decade earlier. So um, that's a good description by Sydney. That's why I don't know if you have the stereotype. I'm sure you guys don't have any stereotypes. But the stereotype many Americans have is that Chinese people are really smart. 
and that's of all the stereotypes in the world to have, that's a good stereotype. The reason we tend to have that stereotype in our country is because who do you think leaves China in the 1970s during the Cultural Revolution? Smart people, professors, engineers, doctors, etc. And many of them who left that country come to the United States because they were being persecuted for their intelligence and their training. And then if you have smart parents, guess what you tend to have? Smart kids. And so that is the reason we tend to have those stereotypes, especially in terms of mathematics and those kind of things, because many of the people that leave China in the Cultural Revolution are engineers, physicists, university professors, often whom are very good at math. And so they often will pass that training on to their children. There you go. That's the source of that stereotype, if you've ever wondered that. Um, so anyway, that's a good example. Thank you for explaining that. We know in World War II, in the Holocaust, six million Jews approximately are killed, and then several million of other targeted groups. Um, Roma, we used to call them gypsies, uh, homosexuals, communists, different groups that opposed Hitler. So lots of different people. But of course, the main victims are Jewish people. All right, very good. Thank you, Sydney. We'll go on to unit eight. We'll do one, two, three, and four, then we'll stop. And again, we will do the rest of them on Monday. So 8.1, setting the stage for the Cold War. Anybody have 8.1? Some of you I haven't heard from yet. I know you're, well, yours could be the second part, I guess. So that's fair. I won't, you may not be able to participate today. Anybody 8.1? Okay. So um, we know that many colonies had hoped they would get more independence or autonomy freedom after World War I. Some of them have been told by their colonial masters, if y'all hook us up with fighters, we will help you out with more freedom. And they were lied to. They did not have that opportunity. Um, after World War II, however, the Europeans also no longer have the desire in many cases to hold on to their colonies because they have too many expenses. Um, it's just, they got so much to recover from. They have so many you know, orphans. They have so many buildings to rebuild. They, they got to get people back to work. And so we got to focus on those things. Focusing on a colony 5,000 miles from home is no longer a priority. So the colonies are ready to be free and want to be free in almost every case. And the Europeans, for the most part, with some exceptions, generally also are just ready to move on with, with some exceptions. But for the most part, that is the, the, the structure. Um, we then see the second part the technological and, and economic gains of World War II produced new superpowers. Our two superpowers, of course, are the United States and the Soviet Union. They will become to dominate the planet for the next 45 years, give or so. Okay? And that's the Cold War, as you well know. So 8.2, speaking of that, the Cold War, does anybody have 8.2? I do. Yay! Lindsay, tell us about 8.2. Um, well, for my illustrated example, uh, Sukumo and in Indonesia, and Sukumo... Well, that's a, well, here's the thing. Uh, Lindsay, that's the bottom one. Can you do the first paragraph first? Oh, yeah. And we'll get to Donna line in a minute. Um, so ep economic um, policies changed because of World War II, which caused the Cold War, and then the systems of the Soviet Union. Union in America caused conflict because of different government beliefs. Okay, so what is the basic belief of the United States and her allies? What are we trying to support or have in the world? Communism? United States? Or Do you live in a communist society, Lindsay? No. No. What are some of the beliefs our government has? Like everyone should have a voice. And what do we call that political philosophy? The words in the study guide, if you look at it, starts with a D. Democracy. There you go. And what is our economic system? Democracy. Democracy is not economic. Starts with a C. Private businesses own things. Anybody want to help her out? Capitalism. There you go. Capitalism it is. Ta-da. Now, what is the system of the Soviet Union? You may have said it earlier. Communism. There you go. With a dictatorship associated with it. So, yes. And these two powers try to conquer the world and spread their ideologies to all the other nations of the planet. Right? Okay, good. Okay. 
Oh, hello, Sierra's dog. Oh, Sierra, what's his or her name? It's Michonne. Oh, Michonne, like uh, from The Walking Dead? Yeah. Is that the inspiration? Yes. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Wow. Okay, cool. And today's guest with pets. All right, next on. Um, tell, now tell us about the non-aligned movement, Lindsay. Um, Sugula was a polit politician who was the first president in Indonesia, and he was a leader for independence from the Dutch Empire. Okay. And so because they're non-aligned and they've been ruled by foreigners, the Dutch have been in Indonesia for 300 years. Do they want to have other foreign governments still telling them what to do after they're independent? No. No. So non-aligned means not associated, not affiliated with either the Soviets or the Americans all the way. Now, they may have some loyalty. They may take some money, whatever, but they are not going to be like Team Soviet or Team America because that would be very similar to the situation they just got out of. Uh, getting free from the Dutch colonial rule. All right, anything else? Okay, thank you, Lindsay, appreciate it. All right, 8.3, ta-da. You got that one, Ellie? Yeah. Excuse me, Ella. All right, go ahead. Um, so the Cold War caused a bunch of new military alliances to form, and NATO is one of them, and it's a North Atlantic Treaty Organization which is a military alliance between North American and European countries that was made to form a defense against the communist so Soviet Union. And then another alliance was the Warsaw Pact, which was a defense treaty between so the Soviet Union and other socialist republics, which is like the same thing as NATO, but against the democracy. And then these led to nuclear proliferation which is the spread of the use of nuclear weapons and those kinds of ideas and also proxy wars which is when um like powerful big countries would use like smaller countries um to fight their wars for them basically and an example of that is the korean war which was the first battle of the cold war and it was basically between the u.s and soviet union and Western countries supported South Korea and the China and China and the Soviet Union supported North Korea and the war last few years, but it didn't really change a lot in the border. Great. Good job. So a couple things to add briefly, or let me ask you this question. Uh, Ellie, did we know who was in NATO and who was in the Warsaw Pact? Were those publicly announced alliances? No. We oh, did, actually. We did. So like NATO has an office building. You can go to it. Um, does knowing who the members of the alliance are, do you think make us more or less likely to test the alliance, like want to fight people? Probably less likely. Yeah, why? Because some of these people in these um, alliances were the most powerful people or military powers in the world. And so if you know who you're picking a fight against and you know that they're really powerful, you probably want to like avoid that. Perfect. It's like if you were going to play a trivia contest with your friends and you heard one of your friends had me on their team, you would immediately want to quit because you knew you would get whooped. So you yeah. understand, right? Because you don't want to play trivia against Mr. Rich. It's going to be bad. So nope. therefore, um, <laughs> that's a great example. <laughs> now, we have these, it mentions Latin America, uh, which would be the example of Nicaragua, Africa, Angola, and Asia, Korea. We talked about some of these examples in class. So this happens all over the world. It's not just in one place. It's both the Soviets and the Americans trying to get up in everybody's business, pretty much all around the world, trying to spread their ideas. All right. Uh, very good, Ellie. Thank you very much. Okay. And then the last one, 8.4. Did anybody have that one? Cool. Okay. I'll do it. So we know that um, we're going to see communism in China. Again, I have a lecture up on YouTube. I'm sure all of you have watched many times, as I've already said, about that process. Um, the Japanese conquer big chunks of China in the 1930s. And therefore, after World War II, when the Japanese are defeated, the people that had led China during this time are blamed. There are people who are upset, like, you let us get conquered by a foreign power. There's a lot of people that are angry about that, which you can certainly understand. And so there's a civil war in China almost immediately after World War II. And the winner of this civil war is going to be the Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, who I talked about in the video. Um, and Mao is going to make China a communist society. 
And because we don't know yet a lot of the details about the Soviet Union that are bad, because Stalin lies and doesn't let people know the truth, Mao decides to copy Stalin's Soviet Union. So he's going to enact a lot of the same policies in China that we saw in the Soviet Union in the 1930s and 40s. Okay, so for example, we're going to have five-year plans where we have our economics uh, organized, structured, and then dictated to by the government. We're going to take people's private land and turn it into government property, all those things. So if you look at the second bullet or second historical development there, uh, in communist China, the government controlled that one. We have what's called the Great Leap Forward. Mao knows that China has to industrialize. He's going to promote a, a system of industrialization very similar to what the Russians did. The difference is Mao decides to eh, try a little different. He tells people they should make some steel in their backyards. You should build a little furnace behind your house if you have a yard, and you should try to make steel. Now, steel requires massive amounts of heat, like we're talking the heat that can melt your flesh off if it were to touch your hand when it's warm. And we're going to have average peasants with no training or safety equipment doing this at their houses. This is a terrible idea. And then we're going to take all our steel and bring it to a local government center. And we're going to all pull it together to form like all of our steel. It's just nuts. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's crazy. It truly is nuts. But that's what the plan that we're looking for. So um, we look at it in that regard. All right. This is a massive failure. We produce less food like the Soviets produce less food. People are not motivated to work hard. People are not interested in trying more, more harder because there's no benefit to them from doing so. So we see production go down. We assume, I've had scholars, I've read scholars who say that perhaps up to 60 million Chinese people are going to starve to death during this time. It's just really, really bad and hurts a lot of people in the state of China. Okay. Uh, that's when it says repressive policies, negative repercussions against starving to death, government control of your lives, secret police, all those kind of dictatorship stuff. And then the last point for today is going to be at the bottom there, the movements to redistribute land and resources, again, communism or socialism. And so we see this all around the world. The Soviets trying to push their ideology, their agenda of a global communist society. The example I'm going to pick is communism in Vietnam. Now, Vietnam is going to be independent for just a barely brief time after World War II. It was a French colony. The Japanese had conquered it. When Japan loses World War II, Vietnam is set free. The French try to go back and take it over again. They end up losing because they're not as strong as they used to be. The reason, the guy they lose to, who's in charge, a gentleman named Ho Chi Minh, Mr. Ho, is a communist, and he wants to spread communism in Vietnam. Much like Korea that we just heard about a minute ago from Ellie, we divide Vietnam in half. The North is communist. The South is not democratic, but it's not communist. So the North is supported by the Soviets and their friends. The South is supported by the United States. Now, the Soviets will give money and resources. We end up sending troops there. And we have the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 70s. Up to 600,000 Americans are in Vietnam. Many of, you know, several thousand of them will die. We end up leaving Vietnam in disgrace with not winning the war, which some of us would call losing the war. And it has, it's had a really negative impact on the United States, the culture of our people. So it's a pretty bad situation. And, this, and the Vietnamese will be communists for several decades. Today, they're kind of coming out of that. They have a stock market. Um, you know, communist societies don't have stock markets. So anyway, that's kind of the update on that situation as an example of the global spread of communism. So at this point, unless you have any questions, I'm done.